Welcome to Whistle Stops, a new program series from the Truman Library Institute. Thank you for joining us for our next trip down the tracks. I'm Cassie Pekarski, Director of Strategic Initiatives and host for our journey through the all new permanent exhibition at the Truman Presidential Library and Museum after a spectacular $29 million renovation. At every stop along the route, this series will provide you with special access to the fascinating galleries, artifacts, films, and stories inside. Before I give the all aboard, I'd like to give a quick thank you to our generous Whistle Stop series sponsor, Black & Beach. If you missed any of our last stops, visit the past events recording page at trumanlibraryinstitute.org or the Institute's YouTube channel. There, our guest conductors will guide you through the museum's immersive introduction film and Truman's formative years in the first room of the Plowed Politics Gallery. Today, we're going to stop in 1917, where Truman's farming the family fields while the nation is on the brink of entering World War I. The Eugene P. Donnelly Gallery covers Truman's footsteps from the Grandview Farm to the Western Front. Visitors will follow Truman's footsteps, seeing the boots those feet filled, along with his uniform, tack box, and more. In an all new interactive, Truman guides you through the complexities of firing a French 75 millimeter field gun before viewing the library's field gun and caisson, which are part of an immersive theater experience about Captain Harry. Now to lead us into battle today is DMG on Greco, award-winning author of The Soldier from Independence, a military biography of Harry Truman, and 12 other books on military and socio-political subjects. In addition to writing extensively for numerous national and international publications and news agencies, he served at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, for more than 20 years as an editor at Military Review, followed by work in the Foreign Military Studies Office. In other words, there is no one better to guide us through this stop today. Thank you so much for joining us. Can I call you Dennis? Oh, certainly. Thank you so much for joining us, Dennis, and being the conductor on our journey to the battlefields of World War I. Well, you know, you're looking right, at, you're looking there on the right at one of the few really good studio shots of Truman during that time frame. I, you know, most of the time he ends up looking kind of goofy with the glasses and he's got, you know, his, his helmet. And, uh, but I, this, this is a good studio shot. And interestingly enough, if you note on his collar, it has uh, the um, MO from Missouri. That's when he was in the Missouri Guard. And uh, here he's, he's a lieutenant. He had not actually been mustered into federal service at that particular, uh, you know, by at this time. And, it, and you'll also, if you look down at the bottom of the card on the left, you'll see that it mentions that he's already served six years in Battery B uh, with the Missouri National Guard. And you know, really, most people have no clue at all about that. Or, the, or, for example, that after the war, after a brief period uh, with no direct association with the army, he went back in. And while a lot, a lot of other, in fact, most officers were, uh, especially if they had much of a rank, were being regressed, uh, they were regressed back to their pre-war ranks. He was uh, thought of at the time again, this is not very well known, as somewhat of a hot property, and they brought him back in as a major, while people like uh, Patton, uh, George Marshall, and so forth uh, were get, getting brought back in rank, they uh, brought him back in, kind of as a consolation prize for him not getting uh, a medal during a, a series of actions uh, where he saved a very, very considerable a uh, number of lives of Missouri and Kansas boys. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> oh yeah, I kind of like this one uh, on the left. Of course, that hat is always, a those kind of hats, they're, they're always a favorite of mine. Uh, basically that design was done so that they wouldn't, uh, and, Cowboy hats and hats of the day would often connect, collect water 
up in the top. And this was um, this design was made to shed the water. But uh, what I like on the left is uh, having to do with that uniform. As you can see, you know, he's a private in that. Now, what's funny is when he came back in to the service, uh, you know, came back into the National Guard. And he was actually, and he was, by the way, serving as a recruiter, bringing more uh, Missouri uh, guys, you know, uh, into the regiment and into the army. When it came to the big meeting where they were going to be electing officers and uh, senior uh, non-commissioned officers and so forth, that's sergeants, he thought, well, you know, with his previous service as a uh, he had kind of a dual dual role in Battery B. He was not only the battery's clerk, kind of its radar O'Reilly, so to speak, uh, but he was also a swing driver on one of uh, with one of the guns. The swing driver being a, one of the see when these things are being hauled by a caisson and limber, you have six horses running two, two, and two. The, and each set of two horses has a uh, has a rider on it to help direct their actions. And the most complex of the three rider positions is on the center pair of horses. And he was, and that was what he did. He was he was very proficient at it. So he was not only the battery clerk, but he had you know a gun that he was assigned to. And I think I have a kitty coming up for a look. Give it a little bit of a rub here. Ah, oh, yeah, there she is. <laughs> she wants to see what's happening. You know, she hears this stuff all the time, is thoroughly bored by it. But you know, there's a camera here. So now she's, you know, heading, you know, heading up. Oh, there she goes again. Uh, lost interest. <laughs> oh, yeah, his, uh, his canteen. Yeah, every regiment had a canteen. Uh, you know, where you could get, you could, it was a dry, Oklahoma's a dry state, but they sold pop and, you know, all kinds of other st stuff, you know, paper for writing letters, you know, to home to, you know, really just about, you know, anything your average soldier uh, would need. A lot of pop sales and they, and he and his people went to great lengths to run down soda pop, huge lengths to run that stuff down. Uh, interestingly enough, now this right here would have been when he was with, I think it's Battery F. And he met many people there and, and Eddie Jacobson, who he would have a long association with, uh, uh, worked for him here. Now, most of these things to the great embarrassment of quite a few uh, regiments and uh, large elements within uh, the 35th Division went bust, ended up like losing all kinds of money, just money out the kazoo. His, because of the extreme efficiency at which and aggressiveness in which it was run, was the only one that was not formally shut, shut down by the division. Consequently, this particular, uh, uh, you know, canteen, you know, this particular uh, operation ended up getting essentially all of the business for the entire regiment. And because they, through great effort, were able to keep their pop supplies uh, up, got a huge amount of traffic from other regiments as well. In all likelihood, most of the men you see here were not in Battery F with Truman, but were guys making a beeline over, you know, to his, uh, his little operation here to uh, pick up. You'll notice lots of can lots of uh, bottles of pop there. Yeah, let me tell you, that was the thing to do. The people, the guys in the battery who were all required to chip in to, you know, pay for this thing, they all made big money back af after the fact you know, when this particular, uh, when they were getting ready to uh, finally uh, ship off to France. Yeah, he paid them out and they, they made money. 
now you had spotted something in particular in this letter that you were interested in. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you get a good you get a good idea of what uh, you know Truman's thinking was uh, in this. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, he uh, he had uh, one of the comments he made in another letter was is like uh, they they fight their way all the way to Berlin. And uh, and uh, and and he and he might die trying to get there, uh, you know, unless the Russians saved it from him, you know, a little a little uh, a little foretelling of things uh, in the far future. Yeah. Now this particular uh, this particular photograph was actually taken after uh, the fighting was over. Uh, this, these are mostly guys from both his own unit, mostly officers from his own unit and, uh, and also from the battalion. I'd have to, I can't see it that clearly, but I think uh, his commanding officer, Major Gates, who on at least a couple of occasions came uh, to, went to bat for Truman when uh, Truman was uh, uh, flouting orders not to fire into the uh, neighboring sector, which he kind of had to do. And Pershing later, you know, gave him a, a thumbs up on that, uh, on, on his activities. But uh, Major Gates had to uh, intervene and help make sure that uh, Truman literally did not get corpse marshaled. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, this is after, this is after the fighting here. Uh, the uh, Different uh, different men from his unit were given, you know, leave in groups. Uh, the officers pretty much went as a group. Unfortunately, you know, Battery D, as you're probably aware, had a bit of a reputation, and um, you know, what the wild Irish guys, and um, well, Truman was able to keep them in line did a very efficient job of it, was very effective, stern, but also increased their food rations. You know, at the same time, there's, there, was a lot, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of carrot and stick to, to his approach and it did work very well. And they really respected this guy, gave him credit for, you know, different things. In fact, during the fighting, which they probably should have given to Major Gates, but that's again, another story. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, Tr but Truman did keep them in line, kept them as safe as he could and was pretty successful at it. And uh, the, the, th the thing about this particular photo is that literally the night that he and some of these officers left uh, for, uh, I think they were, they were gone for about a week. Well, you know, it's like the cat's away and the mice will play kind of thing. Literally that very night that he left, uh, things got a little bit out of hand. Uh, he had left a, uh, he'd left, I think it was Lieutenant Zimmer, uh, in charge. And Zimmer was a very nice guy. He was basically the fellow who uh, was uh, in charge of uh, handling uh, the wagons, uh, limbers, caissons, you know, oversaw, you know, all the care, the, the various men who were uh, taking care of and operating the horses and all that. Very nice guy, heck of a guy. Everybody liked him, but he was not, he did not know how to impose discipline. And Quite frankly, the, the, the battery D just kind of steamrolled right over him. And a whole bunch of them got in trouble in the nearby town or got drunk or, uh, you know, causing all kinds of commotion. MPs are involved. Uh, you know, a, a lot of them were able to sort of, I mean, really kind of think back to some of the wild movie scenes that you've seen. That was his battery. Uh, after he, you know, as soon as he was out of, you know, rode over the hills, so to speak. But, uh, but um, ultimately, maybe only about a quarter of them were actually apprehended. But everybody knew who 
the folks were who were involved in this stuff. And he let really, when he came back, the enlisted men pretty much slide. But there was a number of sergeants that were involved in this stuff. And he could not let them slide. And like there was a there was a whole range of penalties. The one that cut the most was, you know, uh, the uh, you know the denial of pay. You know, they they lost they lost pay over this, and that's a that's a big deal. And uh, you know, he got them back into line, but you know, it's after the fighting. But and he he let the men go, but he couldn't really let the sergeant go. And I've never seen any account in his uh, in his you know his own writings of exactly what he said to Zimmer, but I would imagine it was probably along the lines of uh, some of the things that like people have read about his salty language. Yeah. Now, Dennis, before before he's even in charge of, of Battery D, he has to do something else when he gets to France first, right? And he spends some time at the Chateau before heading off to the battlefields. Well, he was in charge of like training. Uh, okay. He uh, or, or or he had he had a big part in training uh, the uh, the officers specifically in mathematics, which horrified him that that was the assignment that he got and he would he would like really bone up and study and study to try and keep you know just out ahead of what the uh of what the uh classes uh you know uh called for him uh to be uh, teaching that day and everyone and his method when someone would um say well what about this or what about that or like his method you know, because it was, he was only keeping one day ahead on this stuff. And so he'd say, well, now don't, don't, don't get ahead. You know, don't, we don't want people to get ahead of themselves. You know, they're going to understand this better if we keep it all in track and like, we're going to be getting to that, you know, and then probably when, it, when he finishes up with the class, it's probably a matter of, you know, dodge that bullet, you know, because he was literally learning you know, the army is going to assign people to like all kinds of things, you know, that they're not necessarily equipped for, but, you know, he's an officer and they figure, hey, if you're an officer, you can do this. And uh, he was not as, it's just something he would do in his own personal writings, which would lead to a lot of misunderstandings when people would read them in isolation later. He was very self-effacing. He was not probably as bad at it as he you know would go oh you know oh yeah he was probably not as bad at it as he was you know like putting uh in his uh in his uh i can't remember if this was in his uh notes after the fact or if it was in a letter to Bess. because see during this time frame and truman had kind of come of age in the army and so those in those previous two tours and so forth uh when artillery was moving from what's called direct fire where you can actually see a target to having to compute to fire at targets you can't see by grid position so he probably wasn't as bad as it is he kind of let on oh now this is a great photo. I mean, he, uh, the guy literally looks like he's just come down out of the hills of Afghanistan. Uh, it's not a look that most people would associate with Truman, you know, with the side walls, a little bit of hair on top, no glasses, and take a good look at those eyes uh, there. No, this, he had, you know, yet he came in with glasses. Uh, you know, and, and a and a young officer in the army with glasses was, and this is going to sound odd, but they generally were not taken seriously. That it, it, in that time frame, and, and this and this is documented stuff. He was taken seriously just simply on the strength of his performance, but there you see him without glasses. Uh, 
Now this, and you see him circled in the middle, this is, this is after the war and back in the States. What you're looking at here, because a number of men had already been mustered out or transferred, what you're looking at here is approximately half of the number of men he commanded all positions in the battery. Uh, because see, it's more than just the guns. You have the the horse teams, the caissons. You have the uh, uh, you have the uh, the company command group. You have the uh, the uh, the cooks. You know the 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 whole thing. Huh. Two machine gun teams. You know uh, the. Uh, but by this point, this you know it had shrunk radically, but. On the other side of that, this is often the number of men he had to command actually at a, his battery position because the uh, higher organizations like regiment and division and so forth didn't have enough men in support positions. So they would carve people off all the time and give them, you know, other duty, you know, like they'd say, take take three men for, for such and such function from every battery in such and such battalion. In fact, that's where one of his men that was killed wasn't killed under his command, but was killed when he was on detached duty, handling and moving ammunition. Oh, and there's your French 75. They were real skeptical about that particular gun when they got it. Uh, they, 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 uh, they were real skeptical about it, but within just a within just a few days of starting to operate the uh, French seventy five, it was immediately found to be superior to the American three inch gun, which kind of superficially, you know, uh, resembles it. Oh, they love that gun. Truman wrote one letter back to uh, to Bess, um, who was his fiance then. At saying how men would give their guns all kinds of grandiose, you know, uh, names and so forth, and they, you know, and or even just simple things like like Lizzie, and uh, but uh, and if they could, they would they'd probably take you know like any part of the gun they could home with them as a souvenir. In fact, some of them tried and got Truman in a lot of trouble because when they were turned over to the French, it was found that between the last gun inspection and when the French got them, all kinds of little portions were taken. Uh, training wheels for moving it, uh, you know, firing pins, uh, lanyards, all, ki all kinds of little things were missing. French were ticked off. And the guy who got in trouble over that was Truman. And he had to like do inspections to like, you know, in including getting under mattresses and people's bunks to try and run this stuff back down because people want to take home parts of their guns. I mean, it was their gun. <laughs> yeah, quite a good horseman. Yeah, quite a good horseman. That little comment there about he not only commanded the uh, the outfit, he owned it. I think within about one day, maybe it was literally the, the evening after he took over the battery, uh, the men orchestrated, some of the men orchestrated kind of a horse flesh riot of like letting a bunch of the horses loose in the position and made a big showy, you know, uh, uh, routine of like trying to get them together. And I think they were, you know, it, it was Truman's thought at the time that they were doing this to see if they could spur him into, you know, getting all worked up over it and ordering people around. And like, he basically rode up on his own horse that while all these other horses were just going crazy through the battery position and, and the tents specifically, uh, he kept his under control, just kind of watched stuff and ordered his sergeants to get stuff under control and rode away. But he was actually quite a good horseman. And that's another thing about Truman that a lot of people don't realize. Oh, yes. Well, I tell you, you get one thing here, uh, you get a good view of, but 
it was often even worse. You get a good view here of mud. You know, it was, uh, uh, there was really the last, two, their last two months in France, mud was probably their main enemy. And frankly, they're looking a little bit better here than they, uh, uh, than they often uh, uh, looked. The boots look fairly clean. They must have known that they were going to be having a photo uh, taken. And the uh, quote over here refers to when he uh, took out one of the two German batteries I was telling you about. See, the, uh, the division on the 35th division's left did not keep up with them for a variety of good reasons, by the way. It was not completely their fault, but they did not keep up with the 35th. And the upshot of that was is that in that big open area on the 35th's left, the Germans dumped 16 artillery batteries into it that were firing on the 35th from the flank. And uh, a huge number of casualties were experienced there. The uh, 35th Division over about a four day period had like something like 7,000 casualties. I mean, the, these are these are numbers that when you look at conflicts today that the army's involved in, it's it you're getting into numbers that almost don't compute. Where you have a combat division that in that in a flash of just a few days has seven thousand casualties, and his battery was literally on their far left flank. And when it was observed, when an observation plane almost directly to his left dropped a flare down, he saw it attracted his attention. He looked at it and he saw a German battery setting up and the division on his flank, they were not uh, firing into that area and were not really set up to fire into it. So consequently, he stepped in and uh, calculated it very carefully waited till they had withdrawn their horses so that they could not, you know, uh, work a quick exit for themselves out of what he was about to do. He just waited patiently as that, uh, as Verily, uh, you know, uh, mentions here. And uh, when the horses were away, he just pummeled it. He just pummeled it. And, and in fact, from where his observation post was, he could literally hear his shells passing, you know, on the way in the couple minutes that they were in air passing on the way to that German battery. Well, maybe not a couple minutes, maybe it was like 30 something seconds, but he could, he could actually hear his own shells passing him on the way to like take out that German battery. Oh, and again, my favorite studio shot. I'm really glad you ran that one rather than the one of him and the helmet. I use that one of him in the helmet sometimes. People like to take pictures next to it. Had it made to his height, his correct height, and people like to put their arm around him. And then I put, you know, a World War I helmet on them, and then everybody's just all smiles. But uh, it's so that one with him in the helmet, uh, I think it was might have been taken in Angiers. It's a, it's a, you see it all the time, but this is a better photo of the man. This is really much more, you know, gives much more of his spirit and his kind of look and countenance than the other studio shots that you see at the time. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. I know there is so much more that we could talk about, but our train has reached the station. Oh yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> if you have not already, please pick up Dennis's book, The Soldier from Independence, a military Volume biography one. of Harry Volume Truman. One. <laughs> If you can only read one, but you should read them all. <laughs> in World War I, Truman learned that he could lead. Back in Independence, what was there to lead? Well, Jackson County, of course. By 1926, Truman was elected presiding county judge thanks to the help of the Pendergast family. Join us for our next stop on December 2nd as we pull into the Pendergast era in Kansas City.
You can find information about future installments of this series, as well as other interesting programs by signing up for our email newsletter at trumanlibraryinstitute.org and following the Truman Library Institute on Facebook. Speaking of interesting programs, our next event is a member exclusive. Dear Harry, Love Bess is an intimate portrait of a remarkable marriage brought to life by Clifton Truman Daniel, the eldest grandson of Harry and Bess Truman. One evening in 1955, Truman came home to find Bess burning her letters to him. What are you doing? Think of history, he said. Oh, I have, she replied as she tossed another stack into the fire. Bess Truman thought her business was hers and nobody else's, rightfully so, so she destroyed her half of the more than 2,600 letters that she and Harry exchanged during their courtship and marriage. While making an inventory of the Truman home in the 1980s, archivists discovered 184 letters that Bess had missed. Her grandson, Clifton Truman Daniel, will share them along with portions of Harry's responses, family photographs, and stories. The letters provide new insight into the lives and personalities of Bess and Harry during the formative years of his political life. Learn more about becoming a member to participate in this special event with a donation starting at $35 at trumanlibraryinstitute.org slash join. For now, we have arrived at the station and it's time to disembark, but we look forward to having you aboard again soon. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.